to be done with all that now. They're going to have a wedding in four weeks. I got to get to and wear a dress for. So we're we're all we're cracking cracking down now after all the all the Easter candy. But um, it's just it was a really wonderful time to be together. And um, Chris did a great job last week. I thought during the announcements of um, introducing the series that we're going to now for about six weeks. And it's the series that we're calling Resilient Faith, Cultivating a Healthy and Peaceful Soul. And I really believe that there's not one person here today who doesn't need a more resilient faith. Would you agree? Yeah. I mean, there are so many ups and downs. You don't have to live that long in life to know that it's so easy to have a worn out and beleaguered and battered soul in this world. And we go up and down, don't we? I mean, don't you wake up some days and you're like, you know what? I'm at peace with the world. Everything's good, I'm content, my, my spouse is good, my kids are good, my job is good, you're all good. And then it just seems like moments later, you have another day, and you're like, everything's awful. Like, what's going on? And you get yelled at at work, and you're having fights with your spouse, and your kids are off the rails, and you're like, what, you know, why is, what's the purpose of all this? And we get very frustrated, right? I think sometimes we even have that spiritually, right? Where one day we're like, you know what, I just trust God. I trust him, I feel it in my soul, I know things aren't perfect, but he's going to take care of everything, and we're trusting him, and we're just believing he's there, and other days you wake up and you're like, does he even exist? Like, is he real? Like, I, did I make this up? Like, where is God, and, and what is my faith anyway? We wake, we're just, we go up, and we go down, right? Even in one day, some of you will come out of church on a Sunday morning, maybe this morning, and you're all pumped up, and you're worship, and you're a word, and you're all ready to go home, and you're going to, like, it's going to be different. We're just going to be all spiritual. We're all going to be good. And then, you know, by 6 o'clock, you're yelling at your kids. You're frustrated with your spouse. I mean, it's just the way we are as humans. And, and I, you know, sometimes I feel like, how can this be? I mean, aren't I saved? Was I supposed to be saved from all of that? Isn't that why we came to Jesus in the first place? Because we were tired of the ups and the downs. We were tired of that feeling like I got to have a glass of wine every night because you're just, you know, exhausted and weary. You know, we thought, I think, or at least maybe I thought, that when we came to Jesus, he was going to fix all that. Yeah. That's what we're supposed to, he's our peace, right? So he's supposed to be our peace. There's not supposed to be all those ups and downs where it's supposed to be good. We're saved when we came to Jesus. And I want to just say to you this morning, yes, Jesus is your peace. Amen. When you come to Jesus and you give your heart to him, your spirit is made at peace with God. You, you know where you will go when you die. You know that he, you are a part of the family of God. His Holy Spirit is put in you. But faith is like a muscle. And it needs working. It needs growth. It needs development. It needs maturity. When you first come to faith in Christ, your faith is about this big. It's just starting. It's a baby faith. And we have to grow up our faith. It has to be matured in Christ. And so, we, you know, this is, this is what this series is going to be about. It's going to be about how we can build and cultivate a healthy soul. It doesn't come automatically. It's not just by prayer. We get into heaven and suddenly we have a healthy soul. No, God wants to do some growth. He wants to do a deeper work in you and me. Are we ready? Do we want to go deeper? Do we want to have that resilient faith that's, that's just steady no matter what's happening? We just trust God. We just know that he's there. And, you know, some series are more prophetic. They are more, you know, preaching kind of hard and challenging words from the Bible. And, you know, we have to, like, really wrestle with them. Other sermon series are more teaching and learning about the Bible. I really feel like this one is pastoral. I really want you to feel as though you have come into my office and you've come to me and you've said, my life's so up and down. I'm stressed. I do feel like I need lots of wine every night. I, you know, what help me to grow my soul? And we together will start to work on that because I'm growing my soul too. We're all doing this together. And so that's what I hope that this series will be about for you and me. And I also want to make sure that you're not thinking, oh, I really wish so and so was here to hear this. <laughs> you know, my spouse could really use this series. <laughs> this is for you. <laughs> Often with many different ideas about who God is. 
We're moving out from all kinds of different places. We need to learn who he really is. Inviting Jesus into the hidden places that there's emotional health and healing that God wants to do for us to grow up our souls. Falling in love with Jesus. We kind of did that a little bit this morning. It's that awe and delight of worshiping him. Nurturing that. Responding to Jesus in a grace-filled relationship that we get to walk with God and hear from him. And then finally pouring out from a healthy soul. Oh, how we need to know this, church. How to give and to serve, but out of a healthiness, not out of guilt or out of um, obligation, but out of a healthy love for God. So I'm excited. I think this is going to be fun. I think we're all going to learn. I'm now going to learn a lot through this series about how to have a healthy soul. So we're going to start this week with talking about the soul care, about making space for Jesus. And we're going to talk about all of this, really, is soul care. And, I, you know, you have a soul, and it needs caring for. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. But you have a soul that needs caring for. When we're saved, it's like a pipeline from God is opened up between our spirit and his. And so we can begin to walk with him. He pours his spirit into us and works within us. And we, are, we grow closer. We have a relationship with him. But it doesn't mean that our soul then is fully healthy and whole. Right? We have a spirit. Our spirit is at peace with God. But, but he needs to work on our soul. Our soul needs caring for because souls come damaged. We come damaged because of our humanity, our sin that is just there with us. Some of us have additional damage that's heaped upon our soul by our childhoods, by our families, by by relationships, by betrayals and hardships and traumas that have damaged our soul even further. So our souls need to be healed. And that's something that doesn't happen the minute we're saved. It's something that God can begin. But becoming becoming to Jesus is like the start of it. It's like the beginning of, of healing a healthy and building a healthy soul. So you may not have thought about your soul before. What is a soul? What am I even talking about? Um, and I did a little research on this. It turns out there's not a very clear definition of the soul out there. Um, there's lots of different definitions of the soul. Even the Bible is not exactly clear on the definition of the soul. There's some kind of uh, understanding that it's basically the part of you that is everything not physical. So it's kind of the you that's you inside is your soul. George MacDonald says, you don't have a soul, you are a soul. It's the essence of who you are. You're, you're being, who, what makes you, you. What makes you Charles, what makes you George, it's what, make, it's what makes you, you. It's, it, that's your soul. The Hebrew word for soul that's used in the Bible is nefesh, which means the living being that breathes, the person himself, the inner being, it's also the seat of the appetites, emotions, and passion, so that kind of emotional side of you, but it's also the activity of the mind, the will, and the character. So it's kind of like both sides, the feelings and the, the thinking. It's all, again, all of you. The Greek word translating soul is pronounced suhe. We would look at it in English and say psyche. It's obviously where we get psychology from. Good psychology is good soul care. Mm. It's taking care of the soul, the whole person, right? And it's also, again, the seat of the feelings, um, desires, affections, aversions. Um, so, so this kind of helps us to see it's, it's everything. Lots and lots of people have weighed in on what the soul is. Dallas Willard gives us a good definition. He says the soul is the life center of human beings. It's kind of the center point of our lives. Or he also says our soul is like an inner stream of water which gives strength, direction, and harmony to every other element of life. Mm. So it's really the integration of all the various parts of you. Your mind, your body, your your heart, your emotions, your, all of that, your will, it's all your soul. That's all your soul. Let's look into the Bible where it uses the word soul. Kind of interesting, it uses the word soul almost interchangeably with heart and spirit. Not exactly, but they're almost all used together or in pairings. So if you look at Hannah, she's pouring out her soul in 1 Samuel 1. And it says this, but Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I'm a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. So you can almost reverse the two words and say she's troubled in soul and pouring out her spirit. It's like it's almost it's almost the same meaning of the word, right? It's that, that inner part of her that's troubled. First Thessalonians 5.23 says this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the whole of you. Mark 12, 30, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. All of you. Deuteronomy 26, 
Uh, 16. This day the Lord your God commands you to do these statutes and rules. You shall be therefore careful to do them with all your heart and with all of your soul. So again, the soul is all of you. It's, it's all the different parts of you. Heart, mind, body, will, soul is all part of your soul, the different aspects of your life. And so, you know, I had a pastor who was fond of asking me, he'd come in my office, he'd say, how's your soul? And what's interesting about that question, and I ask that sometimes, Lisa and I ask that of each other, how's your soul? And it means something different depending on what's going on, right? It could be that your mind is kind of troubled about something. You're thinking through something, not quite sure what to do about something. Maybe you have a question about something in the Bible or something in life. And so your mind is troubled, your mind is anxious. And so sometimes dealing with your soul is dealing with your mind. And so that troubles your soul, right? When your mind is troubled, your soul is troubled. But sometimes it could be that your heart is troubled. And that, you know, you're, you've been betrayed, you've been hurt, you're wounded, you're, you're, you're grieving. And so that, that is sometimes when we make your soul unhappy and, and unsettled, right? Because you're grieving, because your emotions are hurt. It very much could be that you have a painful or hard decision to make. That you know that you have to do this one thing and it's going to be hard, it's the right thing to do. So there's a struggle in your will. What am I going to do? And that is, that will affect your soul. Sometimes it's... You have pain in your body, and pain will affect your soul. Pain will affect your soul, and even our spiritual life, of course, where when we are out of sorts with God, when we're like, yeah, I'm sinning, and I don't care, you know, we just got to put him out here, um, that's going to affect our soul. It's going to damage our soul. In fact, this condition of our soul is often an indicator of how our spirit is doing with God. And so, therefore, soul care is going to have to vary depending on what the situation is, right? If you come in and you're troubled in soul, you know, when I say, how's your soul? And you say, ah, oh, I'm so upset about this because this and this and this is happening. I'm worried about that. That I'm going to need to let you just vent, right? Just, just, just get it all out. You have to process that all in your brain. It's that, that verbal vomit, right? When everybody just needs to like, pour it out. You need to get it out. Process it. That's soul care. Letting your mind kind of work it all out. But if you come in and you have a terrible loss and your you know, tears are like in the, in the corners of your eyes, soul care for you is just going to be for me to just give you a hug and, Say, let's just cry together for a little bit. And let's just let God minister. Right? So our soul care is caring for the whole being. Mind, body, emotions, heart, and spirit. And let me just say this to you this morning. God is deeply interested in your whole person. He is deeply interested in your whole body, your mind, your soul, your spirit. He is interested and cares about all of it. He cares about you. He cares about your spirit and where you are with him, but he also cares about your kids and your marriage. He cares about your finances. He cares about your childhood and how you were treated and what wounds you carry from that. He cares about your complete and total whole healing. That's what God cares about for you. And that is how we're going to grow a healthy and resilient soul is to let God minister to every part of us. Okay, we don't just let him minister to this little spiritual part, but we ignore all the other parts. That's how we get an unhealthy soul. But we let God minister to all the whole person. I love these two verses. 1 Peter 2, 24 to 25. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. We just talked about that on Good Friday, right? That's what he did on the cross, bring a healing. Well, look at what the healing is. For you were straying like sheep but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. He's a shepherd over your soul. He just cares for your soul. That's what he cares about. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He wants you to have rest. He wants to care for your souls. And when our souls are rested and cared for and healed all, mind, body, soul, and spirit, that's when we have a healthy, resilient faith, a healthy, resilient soul. And so do, I, I, I hope you're excited. I want that. I want that for me. I want that for every single one of us. So today, for the rest of my time, I'm going to just talk about one way, one type of soul care. In effect, in effect this whole series is about soul care. But today I'm going to talk about one way, I think it's kind of the foundational way, or one of the best ways to care for your soul, and it's through stopping, silence, and Sabbath. All right? Stopping, silence, and Sabbath. And um, I, how do we feel about silence? We're usually kind of uncomfortable with silence. Don't, don't put that up there yet. Please take that down. Um, so how do you feel about silence? 
uh, many of us don't know how to be silent. Um, my husband tells a story about when he was in second grade, he went to school, and when he went to school, uh, the teacher said to him, uh, to the class, today's going to be a quiet day and no one's going to talk all day. Now, before I go on with what happened next, I think kudos to that teacher who like figured out, like, I can't deal with hearing any of these kids in the world day. So she just declared it a quiet day. I just would love to know like, what was going on there. But she declared it a quiet day. No one was allowed to talk all day. And so Paul did it, little, little second grader Paul. You know, was quiet all day. But then he went home, and he had a massive headache and started throwing up on the whole head. And so he said for years he assumed that the reason he was so sick is because he had to be so quiet. <laughs> it's like bad for you. <laughs> bad for your health <laughs> to be quiet. And, um, you know, I think we do feel that way a little bit. Like, it uh, can't be right. It can't be good for us to be this quiet. You know, that's not good for us. Um, it's, it's uncomfortable. We want to fill up the space. My brother-in-law is a Quaker, and uh, he and my sister will often go to Quaker meeting. And if you know anything about Quakers, you go into a meeting house like this where there's no preacher, no music, no nothing. It's just silent for an hour. And if anyone feels moved by the Spirit, they can get up and speak. But um, sometimes no one does. Literally no one. And so it's a full hour of silence. And uh, my sister talks about that. She, you know, she obviously didn't grow up with it because she grew up like me without any faith. But um, she said, like, at first it's hard because like an hour of silence is hard. Um, but she's loved, but then she kind of got into it. She kind of loves it because she feels like her mind just gets clear and she just, you know. And, uh, and she said, now when she's out in some event and someone says, let's have a moment of silence. And we, well, what do we do? Like three seconds of silence and then we had a moment of silence. And she's like, are we done yet? Like, that's all. Like, she, she's so used to just that long period of silence. And it's interesting that that's the heritage of the vineyard. We came from, that John Wimber was part of the Quaker fellowship before he, you know, became part of the vineyard. And that's kind of where he got this whole idea of us listening to the Holy Spirit, of stopping and listening. What makes us think we can have a word from the Lord? A word of knowledge? A word of prophecy? What makes us think we can have any of that? If we can't get silent. Just listen. So we, we, we miss on that, I think. I think this is, the fact that this is hard for us and so um, not common in our society is one of our ills as a society. I think it is a problem that we don't know how to be silent. And, and when you learn to be silent and still with the Lord, God begins to build and form a deep, healthy soul. Because there's a stillness that comes upon us, there's a rest, there's a listening that comes upon us. And maybe you know people like that who are just peaceful in the midst of everything going crazy around them, but they are a steady soul. That's, that's, a, that's a healthy soul. So here's a fun little quiz. Now you can put up that quiz. Um, I want you to ask yourself, I won't ask you to call it out, but uh, how many yeses do you have to this quiz? All right, just count them up. Are you constantly checking your technology? I'll say at least once every 10 or 15 minutes. Are you checking it all day long? If so, just in your mind, tell it, yes. Do you have a hard time sitting still and just relaxing, and you feel either guilty or antsy? Some of us feel guilty for quiet and stop, and some of us feel antsy. Do you find you constantly want to have music playing, the TV on, or people around you? Do you have an afternoon free with no plans with anyone? If you have an afternoon free with no plans, do you feel anxious about what you're going to do? Is your calendar completely full for the next month? And most telling you all, can you not remember the last time you were alone? Now, I'm not going to ask you. Anybody, anybody else? <laughs> I will ask you to raise your hands. But it's a little telling, isn't it? How many get checked off? How many yeses we may have to this? It's because we, we, we need to grow our souls in quietness and silence and being apart from others, right? So Jesus gave us an example. So let's look at a little bit of Jesus. He gave us an example of this, of being quiet, of, of coming away, of being silent before God. Um, I want to skip the, the scripture and go to um, Matthew 14. Jesus says, watch how I do it. Here's how I do it. Look, do what I do. So he says this, Matthew 14, 23. He went up on a mountainside by himself to pray and was there alone. This was after, after feeding the 5,000 and right before walking on water. So in between, he went away by himself to the Lord. Luke 6, 12, Jesus went out on the mountain, saw the talk to pray, and spent the night praying to God. 
before choosing the 12 apostles, he did that. Uh, Matthew 14, Jesus withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. This is right after he heard John the Baptist was beheaded. And in Luke 5, 16, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. And that was when the, the crowds would follow him. Isn't that interesting that Jesus did this? That he felt, you know, his God, but he was also human. And he knew how the human body is meant to function and that it needs rest. And it needs time alone and it needs time with the Father. And he knew this was what it meant, and that is what it would have meant for him to be healthy. He had to take care of his own body. And so he did this as well. Um, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that he did this after he, often after ministry. So he would do a big thing with the crowds. In fact, the staff and I looked at this passage from uh, Matthew, which if you string it together, first what happens is John the Baptist dies, and then he goes off to a solitary place. So John the Baptist was his cousin, so he was you know, he needed to grieve with his father, right? So he went off to a solitary place. Then he comes back to the crowds, feeds the 5,000. Huge day of ministry. Then he dismisses everybody, goes off again by himself to a solitary place. Then he walks on the water and has time with his disciples. So just with his like close people that, you know, and he's ministering to just them. And then they go out of there and he ministers to the crowds again. And them. So this incredible rhythm of of ministry, of work, and then rest. And then work and then rest. And I've got, I'm, I'm, I'm grieving over something, so I need rest. Constantly coming your faith. I love that. That's a healthy, healthy rhythm for work and for ministry. It's true for us whether we're in ministry or we're working in the workplace. We need those that rhythm, that break. I gave the staff Monday off after Easter because they had been working like mad, of course, to make Good Friday and the egg hunt and Easter. A beautiful experience for everyone. A lot of ministry goes in to that whole Easter week. But we needed to take off. We needed to just stop and go away and get refilled. And then you're ready to give up again. You don't sound like you stop giving out. You give up again after you've been refreshed. Nobody can keep going and going. And I just want to say this because I know some of you here, are, you know, if I said to you, how are you doing? You'd be like, busy. So busy. In fact, you ask me, I'm going to say the same thing. So this is this sermon, by the way, is all for me <laughs> uh, as well because I have a hard time with I have a hard time with Sabbath. I have a hard time with stopping. My friends over here is like, yeah, you know, I'm going to admit that this is you too, because it is. I have a hard time with stopping. But um, we can't keep going and going and going, whether we are ministering or a pastor or a volunteer, whether you work in a workplace, in a business, whether you do manual labor, what, if you're watching children, you cannot keep doing it over and over and over and over again. You'll burn out. You'll dry out. You'll need that glass of wine at the end of the day. Because it's too much. We need that soul care in memory. So I said stopping silence at Sabbath. I want to talk just for a minute about Sabbath because we sometimes have a hard time with Sabbath as well. Um, what is Sabbath, right? It's that day that God gave us and one day out of seven that we're supposed to rest. And I think many of us get caught up in kind of a negative image of Sabbath. It's like you know, little children being forced to sit still and not play. And, you, know, you can't do any work, kind of legalism. You know, can you do this or that? What should you be doing on the Sabbath? And I think all of that misses the point of Sabbath. Um, God gave the Sabbath as one day out of seven to rest. And I once listened to a really great teaching on this by Priscilla Shire, who's amazing if you have never uh, listened to her. But she did this talk on the Sabbath, and she made this really interesting point that God gave the Sabbath to a people, the people of Israel, who had been slaves. Okay, they've been slaves in Egypt, and then he instituted a Sabbath for them. And think about it. When they're slaves, they never could rest. You don't get a day off when you're a slave. You work seven days a week, 24 hours a day. That's all you can do. And so God instead said, you're no longer slaves. I'm giving you a gift, a day to rest. A day to rest. It was a gift. It was a sign of their freedom that they could take a rest and be able to have a Sabbath rest. And so this leads us to the question, doesn't it? How many of us are still living like slaves? How many of us work 24-7? How many of us never take a break, whether it's from our work, from our ministry, from even families? How many of us are living like slaves to that? Three people behind the rest of the goodness God's given Thing. God gave me the Sabbath. So, you know, when I think about this, I think, why is it so hard for me to take a Sabbath? This is one of my goals with the board, that I, that I take a Sabbath, I take that time. Why is it so hard? And if I'm honest, I think it's because I just love accomplishing things. 
It just feeds my ego, right? I know there's all these important things I have to do and want to do, and, and, and so I, I just want to get them all done and check off all the things on the list, so I just feel good about myself when I'm accomplishing things. For some of us, and I used to feel more this way, and some of us, we feel like if I stop, everything's going to fall apart. If I stop, my family's going to fall apart, or my workplace, they're going to fire me. If I stop, you know, we, we feel like, you know, every, everything needs me. My kids need me. Guess what? Your kids can live if you go off for a day or a half day or even an hour for a Sabbath for time with Jesus. He, they will live. So I think um, it can be a sign of enslavement to the world and its way of doing things if we never stop. If we never take that Sabbath time. We never take that Sabbath rest. So how do we do this? How do we incorporate this into our life as time of these times of silence. What are they supposed to be like? What do we do when we're in silence with God? Well, one of the things we do, what a purpose or a posture of silence we can take on, I'm going to just give you three, all right? Three postures that we take on, purposes in our in our stop, in our silence. One is just the, just the idea of stopping and resting. That's all we, partly just the value, there's value in just stopping and resting. Jesus said this to his disciples in Mark 6, he said then, because so many people were coming chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. He was basically saying, just get some rest. Take a nap. Eat something. So I want to tell you today, you're free. You're free people. And so get some rest. This is this is a call for a Sunday afternoon nap, don't you think? I mean, you're allowed to have a nap this afternoon. You can, you can tell the children that they need to, you know, they can go in their rooms for an hour. They're going to have a quiet time for an hour, and they're going to be fine, and you can go take a nap. It's, it's allowed. We're allowed to take that break. He says, come away. This is something that should be regular at church. We should be stopping frequently, whether it's for little bits during the day, sometimes at noon, you know, at lunchtime, just take 15 minutes, stop and be with Jesus. Sometimes it's the morning, quiet time, or maybe at the end of the day. Sometimes it could be a, a Sabbath day that we take a Sunday or a Saturday. We're just really trying not to do all the stuff and just try to rest, silence the activity. I think rest is also about stopping the words. I know for some of us, we say, well, I pray a lot. I pray all the time. Well, yeah, but when you pray, are you ever silent? <laughs> because a lot of us, when we pray, right, we're like, oh, Lord, I'm so upset about this. And tell me about this. And how I do this. And I'm so sorry about this. And we're just talking, 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 talking to Jesus. Well, that's awesome. He wants to hear it. He loves you. He wants to hear you pour out your soul. But then we need to close the mouth and just stop. And just rest in his presence. Just enjoy him. Just enjoy him. When's the last time you came away and knew Jesus? When's the last time? Let's get away. Let's just stop and rest. Second purpose or posture of silence is listening and reflecting. So part of the silence is just part of the value is just to stop. But part of the value is also to start to listen. This is where we get that, that quicker background, right? That listening for the voice of God. Psalm 4 4 says, Tremble and do not sin. When you are on your bed, search your hearts and be silent. And Job 42 4, listen now and I will speak. One of the points of getting silent is to hear from him. And sometimes when we get silent, he will point things out very quickly. The minute, sometimes if I've been avoiding silence, especially if I'm avoiding stopping, once I stop, oh boy, then I hear it. <laughs> right? Because I see there's sin I'm committing that I need to confess, or, or just insight of what, what are you doing with that, what's your priorities here. Um, sometimes I get direction and things if I just stop and be silent. And now I want to say a word to those of you who have stopped and be silent and tried to listen and never heard anything. Because there's so many people I hear say, well, I don't even know if God's there because I stop and I'm silent and I don't hear anything. I just want to say to you that that's okay. God speaks to us in all kinds of different ways. Sometimes the stopping and the listening is just for us to get our, our body and our soul settled. There's times when I will stop and listen for the Lord and hear nothing. That was a lot. <laughs> well, I'll hear nothing. But I just stop and rest with Him anyway. And then, often, what I find is then when I go about my business after that, and I'm writing a sermon or I'm talking with somebody, then the insights begin to come. See, God had to get my heart into a place of rest and a listening posture, and then it informs and it, and it, and it empowers the rest of what I'm able to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. So I don't want you to get hung up on, I'm not hearing anything when we have a moment of silence. That's, 
Sometimes you'll hear it, but sometimes it's just to create a rest in your soul, a depth in your soul, a connection with the Lord that you may not even realize is happening. It's just like feet, it's like it's just like eating good food. It just starts to make you healthy over time. So that's that's listening. And and I think sometimes we don't listen and stop to listen because we're afraid of what's going to say. Now we don't want to hear from God. <laughs> we know we will, we don't want to really hear him. And all I can say to that is our God is so good and so yes, kind. Yes. Don't you want to hear from him? Even if you know he's gonna say, you know, this thing is maybe a problem. We need to we need to talk about that. Isn't it better? <laughs> he loves you. He's so good and kind. He only wants good for us. So we, let's just live. I'd rather hear. Give me the bad news, God. <laughs> Give it to me straight. What I need to fix, what's what's not right. I'd rather know that. That's how you're healthy soul. And the last purpose or posture of silence is to nurture this idea of reverence and awe. Because the scripture is really clear on this, that part of silence is, is worship. Habakkuk 2.20, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Be silent before the sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. Psalm 46.10, be still and know that you are God. What do you think is going to be the first thing you're going to do when you get to heaven and you see God in all of his glory? His glory on the throne, the heaven, the archangels, and all around you. You see Jesus on the throne. What do you think your first reaction is going to be? I'm guessing it's going to be silence. <laughs> I'm guessing we're going to fall on our faces and we're just going to not have words. I mean, that's, that's what the scripture is saying. But when you see the holiness of God, there's just silence because it's, all, it's filled with awe. Kind of interesting how little silence we have in our worship services, isn't it? Are we really encountering the awe of God? It's a bit of a challenge to our worship team. I wonder if we get some silence sometime and just stay in awe of God. What would that be like? Because that's what it's going to be like in heaven. <laughs> We're not going to be, uh, we will be doing some other praise, I hope, but we will be silent at times. So the purpose of that silence is to take the focus off ourselves and even off of our own praising and just silence. Just on focusing on him. And that's what he says, you're going to know me. We still don't know that I'm God. This is how we're going to know God. Isn't that silence before him? Jewish people say Shabbat Shalom on the Sabbath day. Shabbat, of course, a word for Sabbath, means to dwell, to dwell, to have dwelling. And, and shalom, of course, is peace, right? It's that, that peace of God, that peace, that holistic peace. Um, and so Shabbat Shalom is essentially praying and it's a wish that you have a peaceful dwelling with God on your Sabbath day. It would be a peaceful day, a dwelling with God. And I believe that when we establish these rhythms of silence and of stopping and of Sabbath in our life, we're going to have that peaceful shalom. We're going to have that Shabbat Shalom. Peace. It's gonna, that's how we grow a healthy soul. Hebrews 4.10, last scripture of the morning. Hebrews 4, 4, 9 through 11, actually. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. <laughs> You're going to have to make some effort here. It doesn't come naturally. But the word rest here, I looked it up, means a calming of the winds. Don't you love that? Who needs a calming of the wind this morning? I think we all need a calming of the winds, a rest. So what, does this look, what can this look like? I want you to take a minute right now, and I just want you to think very practically about your life. How can I incorporate your stopping and silence and Sabbath in my life? Maybe this, just during the day, I mean, work week, you just, every noon, you set your timer, and you just take 10 minutes, and you're with Jesus. Don't matter if you got work to do and stuff on your to-do list, you just stop. Maybe it's mornings that you have a quiet time, or in the evenings you have a stopping point. Maybe for families with children, I know some of, some of you are like, well, I don't get any time alone. I work all day, my husband works all day, we got kids, we got all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, so figure it out. Figure it out. Maybe, maybe two hours on a Saturday morning, once a month, your husband takes the kids, and you get to be alone for a little bit, and then you reverse it, right? The next week, you take the kids for a couple hours, and he goes and he's alone with Jesus. But we can do it. We just have to, we have to work on it. So make every effort. It's going to take some effort to figure out how do we get that Sabbath. Can we even as a family say, we're just going to not do all the laundry and all that mess on a Sunday afternoon. We're just going to rest. We're going to enjoy the time. And for some of us, rest will be family time. I know some of you say, I love it when I come home. I 
I get to spend time with the kids and play Legos. It's like a total shift from my work day. I just love that. But I will see you. There's some of you, for you, that has not rest at all. <laughs> when I was raising my kids and I was home with them a lot, when you're the caregiver at home, the last thing I want to do for rest for me is to get on the floor and play Legos, okay? Because I'm doing that all day long. So for me, rest was actually apart from the children. I loved them dearly, but it was apart from them. It was time for me and Jesus. So it's okay. Find out what is rest for you. And let's intentionally, intentionally set up this rhythm in our lives. The world will not hand it to you. In fact, the world and everyone you know and love will grab away every bit of silence and rest that you have because there's just so much always to do. We have to, we have to clean it. And then we're going to have healthy, resilient souls. Doesn't that sound good? Amen. So you're here this morning. So you've already done part of it. You've done a practice of stopping. I'm assuming you have your cell phones off. Maybe not. But uh, assuming you do, so you've not listened to your cell phone for, for the morning. And so what I would like us to do is take a few moments right now to have some silence with the work. Um, we're going to practice what I'm preaching here. And I'd like to leave us in a silence of reverence and awe. We're going to focus on just being reverent before the Lord. Um, and I'm going to give us a three-minute silence. Now, I know that doesn't sound like much, but it's going to feel real long, okay? If you're not used to silence, it's going to feel like, what is happening, okay? But I just want us, just think about the Quakers that do this for an hour, okay? So we're, we're just doing three minutes. But we're just going to do three minutes of silence, and I want, I find it helpful to focus on something. Um, so there's a scripture that we're going to have up here. The Lord is in his holy temple, and all of you are going to be silent before him. And so this is just something to, to center your thoughts. Christian meditation is not about emptying your mind completely. It is about stilling all the other voices and all the other thoughts and clearing that all out so that we can focus on the one, the one who is and, and will always be, right? So we focus on Jesus. Sometimes it's a concept about him, his love, and his peace. Sometimes it's his holiness. Um, but we focus on Jesus. And what I will say to you, if you have not done much silence, is that your mind will instantly wander. Before, before 30 seconds are up, you'll be thinking about, like, where are you going to have lunch? And you know, where are you going after this? And who's sitting next to you? Do you talk to? And all that stuff. And don't feel bad if that happens, okay? Don't beat yourself up. I'm terrible at this. No, it's fine. Just say, okay, I just wander. I'll just put that aside and go back. Focus. Mm -hmm. We just have to train our minds to just focus and be silent and rest and focus on God's presence and who he is. So just to, just to focus on him. So um, it's also not a moment to, to think a lot about a lot of things. It's not a time to analyze this verse. What does he mean by the temple? Um, it's just a time to, to clear all that and focus on him, right? So I want us to just close our eyes for a moment. And um, we need to settle our, our bodies and our minds as well, because um, I've been talking at you and moving and, and um, so I want us to just make sure you're comfortable wherever you're seated, because it'll be uncomfortable after three minutes. Um, and take a deep breath just to rest your body. And breathe it out. And take another deep breath. And now let's just focus on Jesus. Let's just be silent. Let's listen. And be at rest.